leave the jury. You find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... Six reactions of innocent convicts being set free. Time and again, the justice system gets it wrong and innocent people get put away for crimes they didn't commit. Number one, Richard Anthony Jones. Meet Richard Jones. He was charged with aggravated robbery. In 1999, a woman outside of Walmart in Roland, Kansas, found herself struggling with a man who was trying to steal her purse. The woman tried desperately to keep a hold of her purse, but she fell in the process, scraping her knees. Realizing that she was not letting go, the man settled for her phone and and got away in his vehicle. Fortunately, there were lots of witnesses. Police were able to get a full description of the man along with the plate number of his car. The man was described as a light-skinned Hispanic or African-American man named Rick who had long hair pulled back. Investigators tracked the plate number to where the driver of the getaway car lived. He was taken in for questioning. After looking through booking photos of men with the names Richard or Rick that matched the description of the witnesses and victim's description, the driver ID'd Richard Anthony Jones. The victim also also ID'd him. When police got to Richard, he was adamant that he was not their guy. Not only did he have a solid alibi, he was at his girlfriend's birthday party and had spent the next day watching movies with the girlfriend and cleaning up after the party. Several guests also said they saw him, but the jury wasn't convinced. It also didn't help that Rick had already had a criminal record. He was found guilty and sentenced to 19 years in prison. Richard maintained his innocence and appealed his case several times without success. He was behind bars for 15 years when he heard about a man in jail who looked just like him called Ricky Lee Amos. They even shared the same first name. Realizing this could be the man who did the crime, Richard contacted the Midwest Innocent Project. They found out that at the time of the crime, Ricky had also lived at the address registered to the getaway car. Even the eyewitnesses could no longer differentiate between the two men, but the statute of limitation had already passed for the assault and Ricky could no longer be prosecuted. Finally, on June 8, 2017, after spending 17 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. A judge tossed out Jones' conviction and he was freed from prison. Purely injustice, and that's not right. We're supposed to be able to depend on our justice system. It's surreal, it's, it's hard to believe that you're actually going through that. He was also awarded $1.1 million in compensation. Having a criminal doppelganger didn't do Richard Jones, but lucky for Devante Sanford, his savior was behind bars and fighting for his release. Number two, Devante Sanford. Devante was charged with four counts of first degree murder, one count of attempted murder, and one count of illegal use of a firearm. For five years, Vincent Smothers told anyone who would listen that he wasn't the one responsible for four people in the drug house on the night of September 17th, 2007. He told his lawyer, wrote a sworn statement, and did just about everything in his power to get the word out, yet he was barred at every turn and his repeals were repeatedly denied, all because Detroit police had a secret that they were trying to hide. A 14-year-old boy was already in prison for that very crime. It all started on September 17th, 2007. An off-duty police officer heard gunshots coming from the house next door. When he got outside, he caught sight of the shooters. One was six feet tall in his 30s and carrying a rifle. The other person was slightly shorter and carried a hand. He shot them, but they got away. By 1 a.m., more officers arrived in the Detroit neighborhood. Sweeping the area, they caught sight of 14-year-old Devontae Sanford. Devontae was five foot, five inches, blind in one eye, and wearing his pajamas. The officers got permission from his grandmother to take him to the crime scene and swab him for gunshot residue. Then, without telling anyone, they hauled the 14-year-old in for questioning. At 4 a.m., Devontae signed a statement that said he and four other teenagers had met at a diner in Coney Island and gotten including a 30 at the last minute, Devante changed his mind and went home. The police dropped him at home in the morning. That day, they confirmed that not only was there no residue on Devante, the diner had been closed for months. No 30 weapons were used in the shooting and all four teens mentioned had solid alibis. Undeterred, the investigators returned for Devante. This time, they threatened him and told him they would let him go home if he gave them something. So, Devante made up more stories. The police officers typed up a statement that aligned with all the evidence they'd seen at the crime scene. I started sh started sh them. Is that correct? Yes. In this statement, Devante and three others had a 45 count and 47 which they followed to the house. They went inside and stole 
and money. They also wrote that Devante had drawn an accurate map of the house showing where the bodies were. Immediately, Devante signed the statement and he was arrested. Devante's lawyer was not a very good one and by the second day of the trial, he told Devante's family that if he ever wanted to be free, he should accept the plea deal. So, March 2008, 15-year-old Devante pled guilty to all charges and was sentenced to 37 to 90 years in prison. But a few weeks later, a hitman named Vincent Smothers sat in the same interrogation room confessing to the same detectives that he committed 12 murders including the four Devante had been charged with. Unlike Devante, his details of the murder were accurate, and the 45 caliber handgun he showed them was a match to the one used in the sh Yet, the police refused to charge him with those four murders. Instead, they offered him a deal. He could plead guilty to eight counts of second-degree he remained silent about the four linked to Devante. Vincent rejected the deal till they offered it to him without the bit about remaining silent. Yet, even with Vincent's confession, it would take seven years before the case was reopened. The investigation revealed that not only had they made a false confession for him to sign, but the deputy police chief also lied on the stand when he said Devante had drawn the interior of the house. He was the one who'd drawn it. Finally, on June 8, 2016, Devante was released from prison after serving eight years behind bars. Every day I, I wake up, I see that a room instead of a cell is just like amazed me. You know, it was times I thought like I was going to die in prison. He protected me, not the cops. The cops took advantage of me. And the charges against him were dismissed. He walked away with $7.5 million in compensation. As Devante Sanford enjoys his first breath of freedom, Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee were stuck behind bars. The only hope? A face cap. Number three, Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee. Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee were charged with felony robbery and conspiracy. On the afternoon of July 28, 1993, 22-year-old Tito Marino was working at his uncle's store, Victoria Video, in Patterson, New Jersey, when he was viciously stabbed and beaten to death. The perpetrator made away with about $150 cash, videotapes, car radios, and watches, leaving behind a green and purple plaid baseball cap. The closest things to witnesses were three people who were in the area at the time of the murder. The first person had bumped into an African-American man wearing a green and purple plaid baseball cap and a green sweater. The second saw a tall black man bleeding from behind his ear who also had blood on his shirt leaving from the back of the store and a third saw a man he'd never seen before crouched behind the counter who told him the store was closed. None of them could identify anyone in the lineup. There wasn't too much to go on until two days later when an informant called with a tip that led the police directly to Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee. Detectives interrogated the two men and got them to confess but both men recanted the confession claiming that they'd been coerced into giving false statements to the police. At trial, the defense presented several witnesses that put the two men elsewhere at the time of the murder. Yet both men were found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Two nonprofit organizations picked up the case after seeing the many discrepancies in the case. Witnesses had only ever seen one person. The men's admissions didn't match the crime scene. They both had alibis. None of the witnesses identified them as the suspects, even though one of them knew the two men from the neighborhood. Also, Eric had suffered a traumatic brain injury in a car accident before the murder, making it easy for detectives to cajole him into admitting to the murder. Detectives later admitted that they had fed him information during the interrogation. In 2014, the face cap found at the crime scene was tested. The DNA on it didn't belong to Eric or Ralph, but to Eric Dixon. Not only did Dixon live in Patterson at the time, he'd been convicted of a similar crime back in 1989. He walked into a video store and pulled in a video store clerk. He was arrested at the time and released just three months before Tito's murder. On April 6, 2018, after spending more than 24 years behind bars, the charges against the two men were dismissed and their murder convictions were overturned. And DNA has proven the defendant or defendants not guilty notwithstanding a confession. Therefore, in light of the foregoing reasons, the motion for a new trial as to both defendants, Ralph Lee and Eric Kelly, is hereby granted. <laughs> awarded one million dollars each in compensation. Thanks to DNA, Eric Kelly and Ralph Lee walked free. Unfortunately for Daniel Viegas, the one thing standing between him and freedom was a bunch of crooked cops. Number four, Daniel Viegas. Daniel Viegas was charged with two counts of capital murder. 
On April 10th, 1993, 17-year-old Armando Lasso and 18-year-old Bobby England were walking home from a house party on Electric Street in Northeast El Paso, Texas, along with two of their friends, Jesse Hernandez and Juan Medina, when a car pulled up slowly behind them. Then it pulled away, turned around, and headed right back toward them, stopping right beside them. Someone in the back seat opened fire the group. Jesse and Juan got away, but Armando and Bobby were killed. Unfortunately, the surviving two weren't able to identify the car or how many people were in it. The neighborhood was plunged into fear. The detective on the case, led by Detective Alfonso Marquez, rounded up teenage boys in the area and interrogated them, eventually settling on Daniel Villegas. Daniel was a 16-year-old high school student living in El Paso. He'd never been in any trouble before till he was arrested for the murder. By Daniel's first trial, everyone that had implicated Daniel had recanted their statements. The trial ended in a hung jury. He was found guilty at his second trial and sentenced to life in prison. All his appeals were rejected. Finally, in 2013, a new trial was ordered. Daniel's lawyers presented evidence that the detectives had threatened his friends with prison time and getting a by other inmates to cajole admissions out of them. When one of them mentioned a weapon that was different from what was on the crime scene, the detectives made sure to leave it out of the statement. They had also interrogated 15-year-old David without his parents or a lawyer present. They handcuffed him to a chair for over five hours, slapping him, threatening him with the electric chair till he confessed at 2.40 a.m. There were also other suspects that the detectives ignored, Rudy Flores and his brother Javier. They were also seen with a gun matched the one used in the shooting. Police confiscated the gun, but never released a ballistics report. An audio statement from a witness who'd heard them bragging about the killing was suppressed during the trial. In light of this, on October 5th, 2018, after being in prison for 23 years and six months, Daniel was found not guilty of murder and acquitted. The state of Texas versus Daniel Villegas, number 940D09328. Verdict form B. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... <laughs> So far, he has not been rewarded any compensation. Will Daniel Villegas get compensation for his time lost? We sure hope so. But John Boone and Rosian Hargrove were going to need a lot more than luck to get out of the slammer. Number five, John Boone and Rosian Hargrove. John Boone and Rosian Hargrove were charged with robbery, attempted murder, and murder. John was just 14 years old, sitting in his mother's kitchen in Brooklyn, when the police knocked on the door and took him down to the 77th Precinct for questioning. After hours of interrogation with the detective on the case, Louis Garcella, John found himself sitting on a stool, holding a number along with some other men. It took a moment, then the detective let him out, placed him under arrest, and charged him, along with 17-year-old Rosian Hargrove, for the shooting two corrections officers on August 14th, 1991. Only one survived to tell the story. Around 4 a.m. on August 14th, 1991, Rolando Neisser and Robert Croson, two off-duty Rikers Island corrections officers, were sitting in their car outside the Kingsborough Projects in Crown Heights when two men on bicycles approached the car. The men pointed guns at them and told them to get out of the vehicle. Before the officers knew what was happening, a gun went off. In the gunfire that followed, Robert got in his hand but managed to get away. Rolando was not so lucky. He got five gun wounds and succumbed to them five days later. Police say the two gun forced the officers from their car and then stole the car. Though Robert had described the shooting two light-skinned black men in their 20s, he picked out John and Rosian in the photo lineup, both of them teenagers and dark-skinned. In November 1992, after a one-day trial, both boys were found guilty and sentenced. John got 20 years to life and Rosian got 30 years to life. John was sent to a juvenile facility where he was able to get his GED before being transferred to Elmira Correctional Facility. In 2006, John saved a prison counselor from being violently assaulted by another inmate. The parole board rewarded him by releasing him that year. But with a criminal record as a convicted murderer, John couldn't get a job. As for Rosien, he was still in prison serving his sentence. In 2013, many of Detective Lewis's convictions started to crumble as evidence of his misconduct came to light. 70 of his cases had been flagged and 12 homicide sentences were overturned because of forced confessions, misleading testimony, and tainted evidence. In May 2018, John and Rosien joined the number and were finally exonerated. I want to say Thank you, Your Honor, because in 27 years, I've been fighting.
fighting for my life. Charlotte, no day. Y'all convicted and had a wrong man in prison. <laughs> I just feel overly blessed and just thanking God that we reached this point. After serving 17 years in prison and 10 years on parole, Dom was awarded $5.9 million in compensation. Rosian served 27 years in prison and was awarded a total of $11.2 million in compensation. Detective Louis Garcella has never been charged and still collects a full NYPD pension. It took a crooked cop getting caught for John Boone and Rosian Hargrove to get justice, but it's what Stephen Avery did after he got his freedom that was truly shocking. Number six, Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was charged with assault and attempted on the afternoon of July 29th, 1985, Minnie Ann Beerston was out on a run along the Lake Michigan shoreline when a man forced her into a wooded area and <laughs> her. Penny reported it to the police station. Though the DNA of the assailant was taken, technology hadn't developed enough for the investigators to make a match. Instead, they relied on good old-fashioned photo lineups. After Penny described her assailant, police provided her with photos of nine men. Penny picked the image of Stephen Avery from the pile. Stephen already had a healthy criminal record, burglarizing a bar, animal cruelty, running a woman off the road, and pulling a gun. Investigators were sure they had their man, and Stephen was arrested the next day. After his trial later that year, Stephen had 16 alibi witnesses take the stand. A couple of them said they'd seen Stephen at a store in Green Bay, but the defense argued that this was a whole hour after the assault, plenty enough time for him to attack her and get back. A forensic scientist also took the stand and said that a hair found on one of Avery's shirts was consistent with Penny's. Stephen was found guilty and sentenced to 32 years in prison. In 2002, the Wisconsin Innocence Project got a court order to run a DNA test on the hair. The hair came back to Gregory Allen, known se who looked a lot like Stephen. They also discovered that as far back as 1995, detectives knew that Gregory confessed to the assault but never followed up. Gregory was behind bars serving time for another assault. On September 11th, 2003, after serving 18 years behind bars, Stephen was released and his conviction was overturned. I'm glad you're home, honey. <laughs> oh, hello. How are you? Oh, pretty good. It was wonderful. During his years away, his wife had left him and he lost custody of his twin boys. Stephen filed a $36 million lawsuit over his wrongful conviction, which was still in courts two years later when he was back in the news again, charged with first degree murder kidnapping, and assault. Teresa Halbeck had an appointment with Stephen at his home near Avery's Auto Salvage on October 31st, 2005. She was a photographer and she was there to take pictures of a minivan he wanted to sell on autotrader.com. She was never seen again. Her car was later found in the salvage yard and blood stains recovered from its interior came back to Stephen. Later in the investigation, police would find charred bone fragments found in a burn pit near Stephen's trailer, but Stephen was adamant that it was a frame up so the state could get out of its lawsuit. He was eventually awarded $400,000 in compensation, but in 2007, Stephen was found guilty of Teresa's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole.